Jesus' name, let's praise him. Let's magnify the Lord. Let's thank him tonight. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Are you thankful his goodness is running after you tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is faithful. He is faithful. Hallelujah. In every season, he is faithful. The good times, the bad times, I'm like, he's still good. He's an on-time God. So if it's not good, just hold on. God is turning it around for you. Hallelujah. Let's go into time of prayer tonight. Thank you, praise team. Phenomenal job tonight. Time just to, for fellowship and, uh, and for good fun. So, hallelujah. So, and then, I believe that's it. I believe that's it for announcements. God's good. Hallelujah. Uh, you guys ready for the word tonight? All right. Brother Roy, we appreciate you and your family. We love this, we love this precious family. And so I'm always looking forward to you to preach, brother. So we want you to come. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as he comes tonight. Hallelujah. Lord God, you are the king. You are the creator. You are the savior. You are the great God that thunders upon the winds. You are the king that walks upon the water. You are the one that came and whispered into our hearts to be guided our steps. It is you, Master, that have saved us and not we ourselves. We praise you. We worship you. Thank you for bringing each and every one of us here. God, you are king. Hallelujah. 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 There's only one God, and all the angels bow before him, and all of the earth and every knee someday shall bow unto him, and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God that he is Lord. God has broken up his relationship with humanity in what we call ages. When he created Adam and Eve, he created an age of innocence, of purity, of morality. There was no, there was no debris, there was no hindrance, there was nothing between them and God. Just purity and love and, and admiration. But that ended with the fall of man. And then God brought forth out of that, that ended, that age ended. A new age began. And it was an age of conscience where humanity was ruled by their conscience and what they thought was right and what they were pricked in their hearts when they did something wrong. And that ended, that age ended with Noah and the flood and the ark. And then when, after the flood, he, he brought a new age. And that was an age of human government where God started establishing things and orders and you had kings and you had princes and you had principalities and powers. And then that also was replaced with another age which God called a man named Abram out of the earth of the Chaldees and he gave him a promise. He said, if you follow me, I will make you the father of many nations. And he made his wife, Sarai, that she would be the mother of many nations. If they would just follow. And as time went through, that age ended. Another age started, and it was called the law. Where God had called Moses out of Egypt and said, I want to give you a law to give to my people. And that age went on. But how did that age end? Because we're not under the law. How did that end? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Because in the law, they had a priest that would go into the temple. And daily, they would offer sacrifices and offerings unto the Lord. 
And once a year, the high priest would go in into the holiest of holies and offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. And he would sprinkle blood behind it for the propitiation of the people's sins. It would push them forward another year. They always knew that their sins were there, but it got pushed forward. It couldn't forgive them of their sins, but it pushed it to a day that they knew a redeemer would be coming. So this priest, it says, and every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. The law could not take away anybody's sin. But the high priest would do it daily. Daily they would kill a turtle dove. Daily they would slaughter a calf. Daily they would slaughter a goat. Daily they would offer up a sacrifice. Daily for the sins of the people. But it didn't do a thing. They were still in their sins. And it was apparent that this age needed to come to a close too. The next age, so how did it end? The next age was God working. Instead of working through an order of priest, he actually would become one. It was called the age of grace. God working in us to will, to give us a desire, an ability because we could not serve him on our own. We could not determine to turn our back on sin in this world and the ages. He had to come and dwell in us and give us this ability and this strength. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. For Christ is not entered into a holy place as made with hands. That high priest that we read about, he did. He entered into the temple, which was made with hands. But Christ, he did not. It says, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. This man, Christ, went into the temple in heaven to appear for us because we couldn't do it. Nobody could. It says, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must have suffered since the foundation of the world. Think about it from the very beginning of innocence. If Christ had offered just the blood of goats and of rams after the age of innocence, innocence, he would have had to appear daily, yearly for everyone's sins. But he didn't. He offered his own body as a sacrifice. There's some key words here. For then he must have suffered since, often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world. Did the world end when he died on the cross? So it's not talking about the earth. It's talking about an age. The age of the law has come to an end. When he died on the cross, it was finished, he said. Man was no longer under law, but now grace. A new age, a new beginning. And that word, the end. But now once more, in the end. What that's referring to is a courtship. As if a young man and a young woman has courted year or, or days or weeks, whatever. They're, they're over a period of time. They've courted and courted. And then they're finally married. 
That word in means consummation. So at the end, Jesus consummated the ages and he began anew. A new age, a new bride, his bride, the bride of Christ. But the age of grace had begun on the cross. He entered into the heavens. He entered into the holiest of holies. He stands in the presence of God for us. And it says, in the end of the world, to the end of that age, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he appeared before God, and all those sins from the age at the end of innocence and the age of conscience and the age of human government and the age of the promise and the age of the law, they had been done away with. And a new age has begun. A new chapter in his relationship here with humanity. It says that he openly put to shame the principalities and powers in heaven that were opposed to him, that were opposed to us. The enemies, the demonic forces, those spiritual wickedness in high places, Christ defeated them. He walked, it says, through the heavens, and he presented himself unto the spirit of the most high God, and his blood was sprinkled just as the high priest did. He sprinkled it. Nalamashia. You are God and God alone. You, God, has established your love in our hearts and our souls and in our minds. And it says that Christ, he not only sprinkled the things in heaven, but to those of us that have come into this new age, these new believers, he sprinkled our hearts with his blood. He has sprinkled our conscience with his blood. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, talking about Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. One sacrifice that takes care of ever forever what does it say he sat down if you notice the verse before it it says every high priest standeth daily why did the high priest have to stand daily doing the sacrifices because his job would never be done but Jesus offered himself a sacrifice his blood was shed, and he had finished. And it said, he sat down. There was nothing left. No other sacrifice. He sat down at the right hand of God, the right hand of power. That's so significant. Have you ever seen somebody give a speech, and when they're done, they sit there, and they said this, Christ, when he offered the sacrifice, he sat down. It was finished. There's nothing else anybody can do that he hasn't done. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 13. From henceforth, that means from there on, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. What was he expecting? Have you ever sat down and expected something? The difference is, let's compare the, the man at the gate, beautiful, when he, when he was calling for alms, and, and Peter said, look on us, silver and gold have we none, but such as I have give I thee. And it says that that man looked at him expecting, anxious. He didn't know what. But Jesus is expecting something that's a surety. He knows what's coming. It's like 
us getting up early in the morning because we expect we want to see the sunrise and we know it's there it's coming it's done it every single day and we you expect it it's coming it's a sure thing jesus sat down expecting something while he was expecting his enemies are being made his footstool remember the age ended it's a new age those people that are still clawing if you're not serving Christ, if you're not trying to serve Christ, if you're not loving and looking for Christ, you're still in the old age. And it's like people that are a sand trap, and you're clawing, they're clawing their way out. They want to build their own kingdoms. Someday I'll serve God. But you're not in the new age. The new age is grace, God working in you. If you're doing it yourself, God is not in you working it. It's you doing it. He wants you to enter into the new age. The new beginning. And Christ is expecting something. He's on the throne expecting something. Verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever, forever. Them that are sanctified. That's a key word. Them that are sanctified. Go back to Hebrews 10.10, 10, chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That ties with that scripture, verse 15, or verse 14. For by one offering he hath perfected, he's completed, he's pulling us with him forever. Them that are sanctified. We are sanctified by his body, dying on the cross, him arise, arising, entering into the temple of the most high God and presenting himself a sinless, perfect sacrifice for us. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. God's plan for humanity. But what was he expecting? Read 15 through 19, chapter 10. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart. This is what he's doing. This is the age of grace. He's putting his laws in our heart. And in their minds will I write them. we got to allow him to put them in our hearts, to put them in our minds, to write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Still, what was he expecting? He's sitting on the throne in heaven. What is he expecting? Let's go to verse 20. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. His flesh was torn. His flesh was beaten. His flesh was pierced. He died on the cross so that we could live a new way, a new way, a new living way where he has written his word in our heart. He's written it in our minds each and every day. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. Having, oh, let's finish that. Yeah, I will finish that. Verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God. And the Bible says, whose house we are. We are the house of God because he dwells in us. We have his spirit. And we have a high priest that is over. 
who shed his blood for us, whose body was torn for us, who was offered to the God of gods and the King of kings for us. Let us draw near with a what? True heart. That is so precious. I want my heart to be true. I want to be true to the Most High. He died on the cross. He gave his life. And now what did he do? He put his word in my heart. So we've got to draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. That means it's gone. You know that God has saved you. Christ has been the offering for you. Your sins are gone. You have a pure, true heart now. You are saved. You are redeemed. You are going to be with him someday forever. And our bodies washed with the pure water. That's talking about our bodies of sin. It's gone. It's been washed away with the word. Let us hold fast. Does anybody know what that means? To hold fast? Have you ever held anything that's trying to get away from you? And you do everything you can to hold it? Something's pulling you? That's what this writer's telling us. Everything he's just told us, a true heart, pure minds, the sacrifice that Jesus gave, we got to hold it, hold it. Don't let this world pull it. Don't let your flesh pull it away from you, drawing the lust of the flesh, the pride of the life. Don't let it pull you. Hold fast to these promises. They are true. So let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Has anybody ever told anybody, I'm a Christian? Hold it fast. Don't let, if they mock you, so what? I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm redeemed. I'm blood-bought. I'm purchased by the blood of the Lamb. I, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm the son of the Most High. I'm a daughter of the Most High. I'm, I'm, I'm the child of the King. I'm holding. Remember in chapter 11 Hebrews, it talks in the first half about all these great saints that did all these great things. They, they put a flight. They did this. They killed giants. They did this and that. But then the other half, the, the other half said, I'm not going to accept deliverance by anybody else. I'm not turning my back on God. I'm going to hold fast to him. And it says that the world wasn't worthy of them. Some of them were cut in half because they wouldn't accept deliverance. They wouldn't compromise. They were going to stand fast, hold fast, true heart, pure mind, a love for Christ, an expectance. They said, they said they were looking for a city whose maker and builder was God. They were looking. They were looking. They're not going to settle. They had no price. And let us consider one another. Let me go back. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another. And let me consider Josiah, Rachel, consider Brittany, Belen, consider Savannah, Joshua, consider Ryan. Let us consider one another. Why? To provoke unto love and to good works. Church, when we come to church, it's not just to feel good or, or to, and this, this is something that I I've, I've knew in the past, but it, it, it slipped away. I didn't hold fast. To me, it was like, Oh, okay, yeah, we'll go to church. Or yeah, as long as I'm serving God personally, I'm okay. But no, I have brothers and sisters that need me, and I need them, and we need each other. We got to provoke each other. We got to ask, how are you doing? Where you been? What's up? Unto love. Think about what is love, all those things. We got to provoke each other to that. 
and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And what's the reason not forsaking ourselves? Because we need to provoke each other to love and to good works. And so what was Christ expecting as he sat on there? He was expecting the people that would have no greater love than to lay down their lives for their brothers and sisters. They would have no greater love than to provoke his lambs to serve him and to be nourished in him and strengthened in him. He was, he's expecting us as he's sitting on the throne of heaven. He's expecting us to walk and to live in a new way. It says, by a new and living way, God in us, giving us the will, the ability, giving us the desire. The new life. And what is part of this new life? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 5. Now this, it might sound like this is out of sequence with what I've just been relaying. But God showed me this. These people, verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 4. For it is possible for those who were once enlightened. Okay, so stop right there. Cut off that part. I mean, don't cut off it. Let's get past that part. For it is impossible. Who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. That's talking about people in the age of grace. That's talking about us. We have tasted. For we have been enlightened. I'm not saying that we have fallen away, but we've been enlightened. We know that there's one true God. We're not blinded by the devil of, this, of, of the God of this world. His gospel is not hid to us. We have been enlightened. We know that Christ has come for us. He has saved us. He went into the temple before the righteous God and presented himself the sacrifice so we wouldn't be judged. So we have been enlightened. These are things that happen to the people that are of the new age called the church age, the age of grace. We are enlightened. And have tasted of the heavenly gifts. The heavenly gift. Did anybody receive the Holy Ghost? You've tasted of the heavenly gift that was promised to come down from the Father. That he said that he would sin. You've tasted of the heavenly gift. We are believers. We are members of new humanity of this new age called the age of grace. And we were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God. You notice it used the word tasted twice. Verse 4, it said, and have tasted of the heavenly gift. We have tasted it. We have tasted the flavors of it. We have consumed it. We have, it's in our soul, it's in our mind now. You felt God moving on you. You felt the forgiveness. You felt the joy. You have tasted those things. You've tasted prayer. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now, under the law and under the promise, and under the human government, and under conscience, and under innocence, how many miracles did people perform that God used to perform miracles? There were some prophets, Elijah, Elijah. How many others? But we are in the church age. We are of the church age. 
And it says here, we have tasted the good word of God. And it means also we have tasted the powers of the age or the world to come. Have you ever seen anybody healed? Have you ever seen anybody that you prayed for immediately be healed? You tasted, then, Brother Hector, the powers of the world to come, the age to come, the church age. You tasted it. You experienced it. Have you ever felt something? Like, I better call Sister so-and-so. Have you ever called anyone, Maria, and they needed to hear from you? You tasted it. You felt it. The gifts of this new age. We have the privilege that none of those other dispensations did. We are a part of it. And he's sitting on the throne expecting us. Christ Jesus is on the throne in heaven expecting us to be enlightened, expecting us to taste of the heavenly gift, expecting us to be partakers of his Holy Spirit. He's expecting us to taste the good word of God. He's expecting us to taste the powers of the world to come. He said to the apostles, you will do greater works than these. He's expecting us to do those greater works than these that he did. So how can they be greater? In that other room is justice. Now, if there was a 100-pound barbell and I picked it up, it's just me and Justice, and I pick it up, no big deal, right? I'm a grown man. Or say a bag, a 50-pound bag of dog food. I pick it up, I carry it, no big deal. But what if Justice did the exact thing, same thing and picked it up how old is he? Six-year-old, picking it up and just carrying it and putting it away. What would your mouth do? What would your eyes do? Mouth would drop, eyes would open. And you'd be lying in the we did the exact same thing, but his feet was greater. And I believe what Christ was saying to them is he was without sin. He had a purpose. We had sin. We had flesh that was not perfect. So when God working in us does the same thing, it is a great feat because we're involved. And he's given us this privilege. And he's expecting it on the throne. This new and living way. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was once offered. It's always going back to it. It's always going back to the cross. Christ was offered. He offered willingly, willingly. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. I'm a part of, I'm part of the many. I'm a part of this new age. And unto them that look unto him shall he appear. That word look, it just doesn't mean somebody saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. I know Jesus is coming someday. That's not what that word look means. That word look means eager. 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 And what did it say that to those that are eager to see him? It said he would appear the second time without sin. 
to salvation. And that just doesn't mean that, the, that when he, the rapture happens. That means every day, living the new way, eager to see him, eager to see him move. He's expecting you to be eager. He's expecting me to be eager, to desire the goodness of the Lord, to desire him. He said that he would confess us before the Father if we confess him before men. To be eager. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be simple. I want to be eager, looking unto him. We will have no sin. When they look at us in heaven, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. He took care of that from the foundation of the world. It reached to eternity past and eternity forth. And you notice it said the, the powers to come. You have that now. Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. There's so many gifts. There's so many things that he wants to impart unto us. So many blessings. And it said he's expecting us. He's expecting you to ask him when you find out there's a need. God. Sister Natalie has a need. If you'll use me, that's awesome, God, but use it somewhere in the church. Use somebody in the church to bless her. Use somebody, God. Bring it to pass. Lord, Berlin has a need. Use me, Lord. Or use somebody, God. Use us, Lord. Use us. He's expecting you to reach out and to encourage one another. He's expecting us. So we're closing out. Let's go ahead and stand. And um, the Lord laid that on my heart because this whole thing was that He is wanting to do something mighty in each and every one of our lives. He's expecting to use you, Cynthia. He's expecting to use you, Sister Esther, Sister Marie, Brother Lefty, Sister Chrissy. Ryan, Sister Jay, Sister Barbara, Brother Dan, Brother Ian, John. He's expecting you to reach out to him, to take everything. He's not a stingy God. He wants to give us everything in the world, the powers of this age, the world to come. He wants to use you. He wants to use us. He wants that when he sees somebody at the gas station and he speaks, he wants you just to do it. If it's not, maybe it's just helping somebody along the sidewalk. It doesn't have to be spectacular. It just has to be obedience. Lord God, you are our king. And you said that you were going to appear a second time unto those that are looking eagerly for you. Lord, don't let the carnality of my flesh cloud the eagerness I have in my soul for you. Let my eyes behold you. Let my soul seek you out. Let my spirit trust in you with all my heart. Standing, Father, in all my ways, let us acknowledge you. You will direct our paths. We are the church, the body of the living God. You are the head of the church. You are the foundation, Lord, that we have been built upon. Amen. Everybody, please come forward and just worship God. Just worship him.